Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Ask the Expert. Today, we'll be discussing all things exoplanets with our expert, Dr. Jennifer Burt. Uh, my name is Gina Varamo. I am the Outreach Manager for NOVA and your host for today's event. Thank you to everyone for joining us today, including our Leadership Circle and Ralph Lowell Society members. We appreciate your continued generous support. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that unlike us, you will not be on video and we will not be able to see or hear you, but we want to know all of your questions. So if you have a question you want to ask our expert, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it in. Um, as always, we would love to know where you're tuning in from. So when you submit your questions, be sure to let us know where you're watching from. If you see a question that you really want to know the answer to, be sure to give it a thumbs up and it will go to the top of the Q&A and I will be asking our expert those questions first. Um, some other housekeeping we have is closed captioning is available during this event. So if you'd like to turn it on, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle option so that way it will be at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and a sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Bear in mind that uh, closed captioning might be slightly delayed, so be patient. Um, and without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's expert, Dr. Jennifer Burt. She is an astrophysicist working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where she specializes in the detection and characterization of exoplanets. She uses observations from both ground-based telescopes and space-based satellites to measure the masses and radii of small exoplanets to try and determine what exoplanets are made of and identify the ones that are best suited to having their atmospheres studied by facilities like Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes. So Jen, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to join us today and ask us and answer all of our questions. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm so curious to see what people want to know about. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm just going to kick it off with a couple of questions. And while I'm asking these questions, folks, please feel free to start putting in your questions now in the Q&A. Um, so I'd like to just start with the basics for folks at home that may not know what is an exoplanet and what attracted you to studying them. Sure. So an exoplanet is any planet that is orbiting a star other than the sun. So the Earth and the other seven planets in our solar system don't count but pick any other star in the night sky, find a planet around it, and that is an exoplanet. Uh, and I think the thing that attracted me when I was looking for, you know, what areas of research I wanted to go into during college and then into my graduate studies was just the pure amount of discovery space that is still left. Mm. So exoplanets is a relatively young field. We got started really in the like early to mid nineties discovering the first one. Um, and as of last week, we actually just passed the 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. Yes, level. I saw that. That's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, so there's a great, uh, people should Google uh, NASA 5,000 planets, and there's a ton of great press releases and coverage about it. But there has been this exponential growth of the number of planets that we know about. And nowadays, we're pretty sure that every star in the galaxy hosts at least one planet and probably more. Wow. And so the number of them that are left to discover, that are left to characterize, to turn from, you know, a single point uh, to a, a real world that we know something about is a really fun area to just get to play around in um, and get to satisfy all of the kind of discovery uh, urges that you have as a kid. So I really enjoy it. Yeah. So 5,000 exoplanets, that's so many. How, how did we go about detecting them in such a short amount of time? Yeah, so there are a couple of main ways that we find exoplanets. Uh, the two that have contributed the most to that number are radial velocities, which is what my background is in. And so this is where we take the light from a star and we split it into a rainbow, the same way that a sun catcher hanging in your kitchen window does against the wall. And then we look for the fingerprints of the star, these black bands that are caused by gases in the outer layers of the star's atmosphere. And so things like iron or carbon or oxygen or magnesium all have very specific bands that they imprint onto that rainbow. Mm -hmm. And if you see those bands move back and forth in a periodic way, so you know it, it takes 37 days for them to shift left and then right and then left and then right, that tells us that there's probably a planet orbiting around that star every 37 days. It's due to the Doppler effect, which is the same kind of thing that if you've ever heard an ambulance go by, the pitch goes up and then drops down as it passes by you. 
Same thing happens with light. As the star moves towards and away from you, because the planet is tugging on it, we see that fingerprint move bluer and then redder and then bluer and then redder. Right? And so this is a great way to find planets. It tells us how far away they are from their stars and how much they weigh. And from that, we can get a decent idea of what kind of planet it might be, whether it's you know small like the Earth or big like Jupiter. But it's expensive. You can only look at one star at a time, and you have to spend you know precious moments on a big telescope to do this kind of science. Right. The other big way we find planets, which has found the majority of that 5,000 uh, population we have now, is what's called transit photometry. And so this is where you stare at stars and you measure how bright they are. And if the star is kind of sitting in space and minding its own business, then it should be about the same brightness over time. But if there's a planet that happens to be orbiting the star and happens from our point of view here on Earth to cross in front of the face of the star, then the brightness will have a little dip and we'll see this kind of bucket shape. And that bucket, the depth of it tells us how big the planet is, the width of it tells us uh, how long it takes the planet to go around the star or to cross in front of the star, and then how often that dip occurs tells us how long it takes the planet to go around the star. So from this, you get the period and the radius. And the great thing about transits is you can stare at thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of stars at the same time. We use the same kinds of cameras that are in your cell phone to do this, but very precisely and often from space. And so for me, the most exciting part is when you get to combine those two things. If you can find a planet that transits its star, so you get how big it is, and then you can follow it up from ground-based telescopes with radial velocities to figure out how much it weighs, you can put those bits of information together and figure out things like what the density of the planet is, what it might be made out of, whether or not it's likely to have a big gaseous atmosphere that we can then go back and study in more detail with these space-based missions like Hubble or James Webb. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the the crux of what I think about on a day to day um, and where yeah. most of our planets have come from so far. Cool. And, you know, so you identify, you know, the best exoplanets to have their atmosphere studied. So what particularly what characteristics are we looking for to be selected for further study from these space based telescopes? Sure. So a big part of the selection criteria is just, is this even possible? And so sure. what that means is that we're often looking for bright nearby stars where you're going to get lots and lots of light from the star, because what we're doing when we characterize atmospheres is generally something called transmission spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that as the planet moves in front of the star, we're actually looking at light from the star passing through the planet's atmosphere. And what that does is in addition to those fingerprints that I mentioned before from the star itself, we add a second set of fingerprints from the planet. And then we work really hard to disentangle those and say, okay, the planet's fingerprint looks like this. And that tells us that this planet has water in its atmosphere or that it has um, carbon or nitrogen, oxygen, things like that. And so you want a really bright star. So there's a lot of light to make it easier to measure these very small changes in those fingerprints. Mm -hmm. um, generally, we're still aiming for planets that have pretty big atmospheres. So atmospheres like the Earth, which are very thin, are very challenging to measure right now, probably beyond the scope of what we can do with the current level of instrumentation and satellites that we have. But things like Neptune or Uranus and up to gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, those are feasible. So that's what we're aiming for right now. Um, though with James Webb coming online, people are starting to aim for smaller planets and to try and get us closer to measuring planets more like the Earth. Right, right. Um, also, I just have to ask, are those spectroscopy earrings you're wearing right now? Because I love them. <laughs> they are, they're the solar spectrum. So these are earrings that have the spectrum of the sun uh, taken from Kitt Peak Observatory and you can see all the little absorption lines. They're my favorite. I wear them for all the talks I give. Yes, I, I did notice that. I was like, oh, there's the fingerprints. Okay. <laughs> In case anyone wanted visual what it looks like, there you go. Yeah, but I'll take it off. I can hold it up close so you can see. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we already have a bunch of audience questions, so uh, I'm going to start getting to a few of them. So folks, once again, if you have questions, please go ahead and start to put them in. And if you have any you like, uh, give them a thumbs up and we will get to them first. So our first question I want to ask you is from Rich, and he would like to know, given the distance and time required to travel to exoplanets and not knowing how entirely different planets might have evolved life, how will, can, or can we definitively determine if there's life there? Good question. So this is a, a big topic at NASA. One of NASA's main goals is the search for life uh, in the galaxy, in the universe. Right. 
The real answer is that we don't know <laughs> yet. I'm going to be honest with you here. Um, you're right, Rich, that there's a lot of different ways that planets can form and evolve, and there's no guarantee that they're going to look just like the Earth or that life on those planets will look just like us or the plants or animals here on Earth. Because at the moment we have a sample size of one where we know that life has managed to evolve, we start off by looking for things that look like us. Right. And so what that means generally is that when doing things like studying planet atmospheres, we're looking for signatures of water and oxygen and ozone and methane. So mm -hmm. gases that on Earth are caused at least in part by living organisms. Now, there are a lot of other ways to create oxygen and methane, um, you know, plants and volcanism and geothermal uh, events all put these gases into the air as well. And so the real thought within the community is that the first detection of life is not going to be a definitive, there are aliens on that planet. It's probably right. going to be, we think the likelihood that these gases are caused by life is very high, you know, 96% or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really a statistics game. And we're working very hard to find ways to say, we see these signatures, they they could be caused by life. Let's try and rule out the other causes to a point where we're relatively confident that this probably has to come from a living organism. But 100% certainty is probably a ways off. And you're right that current propulsion methods cannot get us to these planets. So it's all gonna be done indirectly from Earth. Um, probably the next big step is, so NASA announced recently that in the 2040s, they wanna launch their next big flagship mission and this is a mission that is going to try and take pictures directly of Earth-like planets around nearby sun-like stars. Wow. And so in this case, cool. yeah, instead of doing this transmission spectroscopy where you're disentangling the planet from the star and it gets a bit messy, we would be able to take pictures of the planets themselves, which is a much clearer way to get a look at what's going on in their atmospheres, what those planets are like. So that's the, the big focus right now is, you know, let's look at the hundred closest stars that are like the sun and start searching those for signs of planets like the earth in that temperate habitable zone. Yeah. So I, I actually saw a question speaking of, you know, thinking of life, um, you know, signatures or, you mm -hmm. know, biosignatures. Um, we have a question that's a little farther down that is related um, by Philip, who says, hooray for, hooray for exoplanets, but closer to home, what's the latest on the atmospheric studies of phosphine and Venus? Um, so, um, and, you know, what's, do we have anything that's going on with that? So for, for folks that may not be aware, uh, maybe was it about a year ago or so, where we yeah. thought we- A couple of years now, I think. The yeah, pandemic has removed all sense of time, so. <laughs> Before the right? pandemic, I think. <laughs> It doesn't matter um, where um, scientists detected uh, phosphine in Venus's atmosphere, which was a big, big discovery for us because it's usually thought of as a chemical that, you know, you need life in order for it to be present. So um, could you talk a little bit about that, about where where we are in that study and, you know, kind of what we're feeling about that? Yeah, so this, as you said, was a result that came out a couple of years ago now where folks um, using ground-based facilities detected what looks like phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. And to be very clear, the folks who wrote this paper, many of them are excellent scientists who were based at uh, either MIT or Harvard, so Boston locals, uh, did not say, we think this is aliens, but they said, right. <laughs> we're very clever people who have thought very hard about all the ways that we can think of to make phosphine in Venus and we have ruled them all out as possible explanations given the amount of phosphine and where it seems to be in the atmosphere and other things like that. And so they said to the community, here's our result. We can't explain it. We welcome other folks to try, which is a very healthy approach to science. I would agree. Yeah. Yes. And so there's been some back and forth in the literature of, you know, different groups looking at the signal and saying, is it really there because it's, a, you know, a small signal. If you process the data differently, maybe it gets weaker and that's concerning. And then the first team can make it the no, no, it's really robust. You know, we did it X, Y, Z different ways, still there, looks good. So the answer is at the moment, we don't have a definitive solution. No one has come up with a solid, like here is a geophysical explanation for the phosphine as far as I'm aware. So it's still a bit of a question mark. But one of the exciting things um, that's happening in the coming years, decades, is that NASA's solar system division just selected two Venus missions. And oh. so there are going to yeah, be two new missions going to Venus to study it in more depth, which is something that we haven't done, goodness, in decades at this point, I think. Yeah. And so 
maybe motivated in part by phosphine, also because Venus is just a great planet and we should learn more about it as you know one of our closest neighbors. Uh, we're going to be sending some new missions there, and that should hopefully provide some new insights into what could be causing this signal and maybe help solve this mystery. Yeah, that's super cool. <laughs> um, and you know, also talking about uh, the chemical thumbprints. So we talked a bit about phosphine. Um, one of our uh, attendees, Lisa, would like to know what exoplanet chemical thumbprints will the Webb telescope be looking for first? Will it be things like phosphine or will it be more things like water, oxygen, things like that? Yeah, so the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which launched at the end of last year and has just now finished the first stages of its commissioning and seems to be doing great is this revolutionary change uh, in how we're going to get to look at exoplanet atmospheres because the main facility that's helped us with that in space thus far is the Hubble Space Telescope and Hubble's view of the universe is mostly in the visible part of the spectrum and a little bit into the ultraviolet so it's on the bluer end of things okay. and what James Webb is going to do is actually take a step you know to the right it's going to look at the redder side of things into the near infrared and infrared bands and so that's going to allow it to look for things like water and methane are the two big uh, biosignatures that James Webb will be looking for signs of. But there are a lot of other trace gases that it'll be studying as well. Cool. And so it'll do that at a, a much higher resolution than Hubble, which should allow it to find smaller, smaller fingerprints, narrower fingerprints. So the dark lines that would kind of get glossed over when you don't have uh, many points along the wavelength axis. So James Webb is going to let us do a better job of finding these signatures and really measuring exactly how deep they are, exactly how wide they are, things like that. Oh, great. Um, we have another question from Elaine. Um, so she asked, how many exoplanets are there, which we talked about, there's about mm -hmm. 5,000 confirmed. How many are not confirmed is what I would love to know. Ooh, that's um, a good question. Mm -hmm. And um, she would like to know how many are in the so-called Goldilocks zone. Um, so I think also just as a follow-up, if folks don't know, could you kind of talk about what the Goldilocks zone is? Sure. Yeah, so to your first question, so we have 5,000 confirmed planets. And that number is maintained by NASA's Exoplanet Archive. So there's a whole team of scientists whose job it is to you know, maintain this list and only add the planets that we're very sure are real. And so they do that by making sure the planets have been observed by at least two methods, because you can often have false positives or false signals when you're looking at a, a star and looking for planets in just one way. But if you see it show up in two different methods, that's a pretty good sign that the signal is real. Um, or people have done statistical validations, which means they've said, let's think of all the ways that this false signal could have originated. Can we you know, prove that none of these are the cause? If so, we are left with the assumption that this must be a planet. So 5,000 planets that way. From the TESS mission alone, which is NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, we are up to something like, I think it's just over 4,000 now planet candidates. So these oh, are signals. Yeah, planet planet candidates that TESS has found that have not yet been confirmed. And so wow. there's a lot of people, myself included, working very hard to follow up those planets, doing things like radial velocity mass measurements or other types of follow up. And we've confirmed now mm, something like a couple hundred of them, I think. But and TESS only launched in 2018, right? Or around yeah, 2017, then? I think 2017, and then they started science in 18. But yeah, it is. TESS is doing this great approach where it is surveying almost the entire sky. It looks at one strip of the sky at a time for about a month, and then it shifts over and does the next strip, goes all the way around, flips upside down, does the same thing in the other hemisphere, and it's just kind of retracing a lot of those steps. But it is looking at hundreds of thousands of stars every month. And because we think that most stars host at least one planet, it is being very successful in finding many planets. <laughs> So it sounds like we need more scientists like you to get through all these planets. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, there's a point where this becomes people power limited. And so, you know, we are working hard to train up the next generation of exoplanet scientists. And there are a lot of amazing students doing phenomenal work on this. But it's a combination of like more people hours and more telescope time to go after. There are just too many planet candidates for us to actually tackle, you know, to keep up with the rate in which they're increasing. Well, yeah, I mean, the fact that what since we started exoplanet science and we have 4,000 confirmed candidates now just that large amount of time compared to what like five years yeah we've already gotten 4,000 candidates that's incredible 
Yeah, if you look at the plot of like, you know, the number of exoplanets we've known about as a, a function of date, it's, you know, it, it slopes up slowly for the first decade or so, which is when we're mostly doing these radial velocity surveys where we're looking at one star at a time. And, you know, you can look at maybe like 20 stars per night on a telescope if you're really efficient. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then in comes the era of first the Kepler teles the space telescope and right. then tests. And all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at thousands or hundreds of thousands of stars per night. And so the number of detections just like skyrockets. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's so, <laughs> that's insane. That's so yeah. um, we have a question from Jim who would like to know, um, are the exoplanets light years away? So if there is intelligent life on there, wouldn't it make communicating with it, with uh, that intelligent life very difficult or should we just be patient? Yeah. So because of the the fact that we need to be able to isolate single stars and we need them to be relatively bright. Almost all of the stars, I think all of the stars we're really looking for exoplanets around are within the Milky Way. So they are relatively local to us, but the Milky Way is a big galaxy. And so many of them are tens, if not hundreds of light years away. And so indeed, if we were trying to communicate with those planets, then there is a, a whole lot of lag time in what that communication would look like. Now, there are folks working very hard uh, within the SETI initiative, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, and teams at a variety of universities, like Penn State is leading a lot of this work right now, that are looking for what we call technosignatures. And so this is looking at light from stars and planets and trying to identify, I'm going to summarize this poorly because it's not exactly what I think about most days, but like patterns in the light or things that you wouldn't expect to occur naturally but it is a bit of a, a needle in a haystack search. So they're coming up with very clever ways to efficiently and effectively search for these needles that might be signs. But even if we found something that looked really promising, if we then sent a return signal, it would take decades, if not centuries to get there. So very, very slow mailing methods between exoplanets and us right now. Yes, so we do need to be patient. <laughs> Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee uh, who wants to know a bit something a bit more general as opposed to about exoplanets. Um, why and how is the universe expanding and Ooh. what is it expanding into? Oh, okay. Um, it's been a while since I tried to explain this or thought about it. <laughs> so yeah, we, we know the universe is expanding because if we measure the light from not so much the stars right around us, but from other galaxies that are further away, we see that they are all moving away from us. And so the way that um, we often visualize this is if you think of you know, the, a balloon, if you inflate it just a little bit and like put some dots on it and you say, okay, we are this dot and then here are all the other dots that are different galaxies. And then you blow the balloon up more, all those dots are moving away from each other. That's kind of what's happening. So no matter what direction you look in, the galaxies are moving away from us. That tells us the universe is expanding. What it's expanding into is not, I think, a well-defined concept. I think that's like the question of the century, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it's not that like our universe started and then there's a bubble of like empty stuff around us um, that we are slowly filling and we're going to run out of room. It's the universe is, you know, it started in, we think, the, the Big Bang, so this very small point, and then blew up and has been expanding ever since. And into what? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. Oh. We can make some very wild guesses. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, is that part of what Webb is also studying as well? Or are they looking, focusing more on the beginnings of the universe as opposed to, uh, you know, how we're expanding? They're tied together a little bit. Um, so the analogy I've heard that I like is that, you know, Hubble was able to look back at, at faraway galaxies. So there's this nice aspect of astronomy where the further away something is that you're looking at, the earlier in time you are seeing it, because the light from that star or galaxy has taken, again, centuries, uh, millennia to reach us. And so you're seeing it as it was, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of years ago. And so Hubble, because it's looking in the ultraviolet and the visible, is able to see like the toddler stage of the universe. Right. Whereas James Webb, by moving into the infrared, can actually look into like the infant stage of the universe. So we're getting closer and closer to looking at those very early stages of, you know, our universe as we know it, what it looked like back then. And that's be both because we can, you know, see slightly more distant um, objects because James Webb is much bigger, but also because 
as everything is expanding, the light from these objects also redshifts a little bit. And so even if they were originally emitting things in the visible, because of the same kind of Doppler shift effect and, and some general relativity type things, uh, that light shifts further and further into the red. And so observing with a big telescope in space in the infrared is a great way to peer back into these very early stages of the universe. Yeah, it's really cool. There's like people that consider themselves like astronomical archaeologists yeah. or like <laughs> fossil, like basically treating fossils as light. And it's just such a such a cool, cool concept. It's because we all actually want to be Indiana Jones and we just need to find right? justify that to ourselves. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't want to be Indiana Jones in space? <laughs> it's like best of both worlds coming together. Um, so we have a, a question from Dean who's in Brighton locally. Um, who wants to know, have you personally discovered any exoplanets? And um, can the people or teams who discover these planets name them? Oh, good. Yeah, I have. I have six planets to my name now, I believe, um, cool. yeah, that I, I led the papers on. These are all huge team efforts. And so I, for none of these, can I say that like I am the only reason my planet, planet was right. discovered. But I am the lead author on all of those papers. Uh, you cannot name exoplanets, which is kind of a bummer. Um, they are informally dedicated to various family members. Uh, and so there's like, one is my mom's planet and one is my sister's planet and one is my dad's planet. But you can't put that in the paper, the journals will yell at you. So it's right. an informal list that I have somewhere. What a um, gift, right? Like, mom, I named a planet after you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can't name them, unfortunately. The way that we name planets is a little bit boring, I'm gonna be honest. We take the name of the star, which is often some telephone number that is, you know, where it sits in a certain catalog. So like bright stars often have HD numbers, which is the Henry Draper catalog. So, you know, HD 185144, it's a very famous radial velocity standard star. Um, and then if you find a planet around a star, you stick a lowercase b after it. And then if you find another planet, you stick a lowercase c. And so it tells you what catalog the star is from, which tells you a little bit about like how bright it is and when it was first noted and things like that. And then the letters often tell you the, the order of discovery. Um, I think the only things that you can still name if you discover them are comets and asteroids. I think those are the two where like you can put your name on it and NASA's cool with it. Cool. There was actually, people should look this up though. There was a fun effort um, two, a few years ago. Again, time has no meaning because of COVID. Uh, some years ago, where the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, had a contest where they let every country name a star and therefore kind of the planets that go along with it. Oh. Um, or maybe it was actually named name the exoplanets themselves. I think that's right. And so every country was given a star and the planets that are known to be around it. And then most countries had competitions within themselves to say, what should we name these? And so I believe the, the star that the US got has two planets around it. And the winning submission was, I want to say it's the, the name of a couple of rivers in Alaska, the like uh, indig indigenous names for them. But you can, if you look up like IAU um, planet naming or something, I'll find a better search term for it. But there's a great list of like, here are all the ones that now have official names. They don't show up in the literature all of the time, but it's a fun reference if you just want to know like clever things that people came up with to name their planets. Cool. Um, we have a question from Rob, who's uh, writing in from the Cape, and he would like to know if the exoplanet's gravity is too high, um, would a civilization be trapped on the surface and would they be studied as closely? Ooh. So the, the surface gravity of a planet is definitely a thing that we take into account when deciding which ones to try and follow up with these atmospheric studies, because the higher the surface gravity, the closer in all of those atmospheric gases are held to the planet. So they're tighter in, they're often held you know, more densely then, and that makes them harder to study. There is, it's harder for the light to permeate through and show us those fingerprints. Um, so that is a, a point against planets sometimes and that it makes them a little more challenging. Um, and then certainly if the, the, there's a civilization on the surface, higher surface gravity makes it harder to achieve lift. You know, it'd be harder for rockets to take off or things like that. And so, yeah, I can imagine that that would make you know, things like getting into space 
more difficult. So those are probably ones that will, you know, be studied later on, or if they're around very nearby, very bright stars, where even though it's harder for the light to get through the atmosphere of the planet, there's just so much light from the star that we can do it anyways. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Mike who would like to know, understandably, we're focused on carbon-based forms of life here on Earth. So with so many planets with atmospheres highly toxic to Earth life and not involving carbon or oxygen, is there any theoretical work going on regarding possible feasible life forms not involving carbon or oxygen? So maybe we're considering energy sources, replication, or things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that the answer to that almost certainly is yes, but that I don't know of it off the top of my head. Um, the field of, you know, astrobiology and planetary habitability is a, another kind of a bubble of exoplanet science that has been growing a lot over, especially the last decade or so, as we're finding smaller planets um, and planets more like the Earth. And so there are a lot of folks thinking about this. Again, I think the majority of them are focusing on life like us because we know that it is a type of life that can exist and does exist but it would surprise me not at all to know that there's like whole teams of folks that are investigating you know uh silicon based life or you know pick your favorite element and use that as the building block instead of the kind of carbon nitrogen oxygen trio that makes up us great um, Catherine would like to know, what's the importance of discovering and studying exoplanets? Um, because they're awesome, uh, is my, my go-to answer. <laughs> but no, it's, I, I think, so people study exoplanets for a lot of different reasons. So I can speak personally, um, but, you know, ask 10 astronomers and you will get 10 different answers. For me, I really like trying to answer the question of our planet and our solar system's place in the universe. And so... You know, again, as we think about like, are we alone? Is there life elsewhere? The big question is, are there other systems like our own out there where we think life is more likely to emerge? And to answer that question, you need to do a couple of things. You need to establish a very broad exoplanet demographics understanding. And so that requires surveying, you know, hundreds of thousands of stars and saying, what kinds of planets do we see? What kinds of orbits are they in? What kinds of stars are they around? do we see anything that looks like us out there? Um, the answer thus far is actually no. Now that is probably mostly due to observational biases. It's currently very hard, if not impossible, to detect a planet like the Earth around a sun like the star with our two main detection methods. It's a very small signal. It's challenging in a number of ways. And finding planets like Uranus and Neptune, which are on many decade orbits, is very hard because we've only been doing this for about 30 years. Right. And so, you know, it takes Neptune longer than that to go around the sun. And so we're, we're just now pushing into like, we can see things on Jupiter and Saturn's orbit in uh, radio velocity data because we've been looking at some of the same stars since the mid nineties. But pushing beyond that finding, you know, the, the equivalence to our outer solar system is still a little bit beyond the scope of what we can do just because of our observational baselines. But so combining that kind of science, like let's understand the big picture and what all these family portraits of the, these solar systems looks like with let's do very detailed characterization of the planets that are most interesting to us and see if they really do look like the earth or are they you know, earth sized and the mass of the earth, but they're so close into their stars that they're being completely irradiated and blasted by light from the star. That, that's not us. That's not somewhere that humans can live. So, okay, let's move to the next one and the next one. And again, dig in and try and figure out which planets look like us. I love combining those two areas and saying, what is the likelihood of finding our solar system elsewhere? And what does that tell us about the main methods of planet formation and evolution in the galaxy? And, you know, whether or not other systems like ours exist everywhere and we just can't see them yet or are we really strange maybe we're the weird kids on the block and there's not something else like us nearby yeah those are all really great questions and um we have a lot more questions to get to through the rest of our time but for the meantime uh we're going to take a quick break uh and i want to introduce my colleague sandy who has a very special offer for y'all so uh sandy take it away
Thank you so much, Gina, and thank you to everyone at home. I'm Sandy Chin from GBH's Member Engagement Department, and we're so glad you can join us today. And if you value GBH programs and events like this one, we ask you to please make a donation. And today, if you are able to give $6.25 a month as a GBH sustaining member or $75 all at once, we will send you the furthest Voyager in space on DVD. The farthest tells the story of the twin Voyager spacecraft sailing through interstellar space more than 12 billion miles from Earth. And the story is told through firsthand accounts from the passionate men and women who built the ships and guided their journeys. Talk about people powered. Make this a part of your viewing library by supporting GBH today. And here's how, there are three ways to give. Click on that link that you see in the chat tab now, which takes you to gbh.org slash support events to make a donation. And if texting is easier, you can go ahead and text the letters GBH to 800-204-3811 or scan that QR code right here on your screen to open the secure donation form on your smartphone or device. Long after the sun has flamed out, it's said that the twin voyagers are likely to be sailing on and perhaps the only evidence that we ever existed. Learn more about how this mission has earned its place in the pantheon of human achievements and support lifelong learning and important community conversations by giving to GBH now. And if you're already a GBH member, we sincerely thank you for your support. And now back to Gina with more of your questions for Jen. Excellent. Thank you, Sandy. That's a great offer. So um, in the theme of still talking about space and exploration and community, we're going to continue our conversation uh, with Dr. Jennifer Burt. And uh, as a reminder, you can still keep putting your questions in the Q&A. We're going to get to as many as we can. Um, and uh, to kick off the second part of our event, uh, someone would like to know, what's the most astonishing recent discovery for you? Ooh. There have been so many. Um, one that, that I really liked is, so back in mm, 2016, I believe, um, there was an announcement of a planet discovered around the closest star to us, which is Proxima Centauri. So the Centauri uh, Alpha, Beta, and Proxima Centauri are this triple star system that are about four light years from the Earth. Um, so they're the closest stars to us, and Proxima is the closest of the three. And you know, we've been saying for a while, we think exoplanets are really common. We think most stars host at least one planet. And then there was this great announcement in yeah, 2016 or so that was like, we have found a planet around literally the closest star to us. This is, you know, good reinforcement that, that this idea that exoplanets are everywhere is true. And then earlier this year, um, there was an announcement of two more planets that they think they've discovered around that same star. And so this was done with uh, the Espresso facility, which is a new, um, relatively new radio velocity uh, facility or radio velocity spectrograph on the, um, the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, because we're really clever with naming things in astronomy uh, that's down in the Southern Hemisphere. And so they found two more planets around it. And I think it just goes to show, again, it reinforces this idea that exoplanets are everywhere and also that there is a lot of benefit to these sustained surveys where, you know, just because we found one exoplanet, that doesn't mean that's the end of the story. We should keep observing these stars and work our way out towards being sensitive to planets uh, that are further from their stars on longer periods that have, you know, smaller signals because they're further away. And so Espresso is kind of leading this next generation of more precise measurements of especially bright nearby stars. And it, it really showcased the, the value to this and that it's allowing us to find, you know, more cooler, more temperate planets, smaller planets, things that are especially interesting to those of us who want to find things like the Earth eventually. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we have a question from, from Rich who has a question about transit. Mm -hmm. So since a star transit must be aligned with the plane of our planet, is there a random distribution of transits so that we can only ever see a tiny fraction of all exoplanets that may exist using this method? Yeah, so that's, while transit photometry is super powerful because we can look at so many stars at once, there is this inherent aspect to it, which is in order for us to see the planet transit the star, it has to, from our point of view, align very carefully such that it passes in mm -hmm. front of its star. 
And so you're right that we think those orientations are mostly randomized. Um, and we therefore expect, I think the number is like 10% on average. So of the planets orbiting their stars, about 10% of them should be visible from our viewpoint here on Earth. So we are missing a lot of them. Wow. That maybe drives home the fact that like Tess has found 4,000 planet candidates and that's only 10% of the planets that maybe exist around the stars it's been surveying, probably less than that. Uh, so yeah, exoplanets are just, you can't miss them nowadays. They are everywhere. And even when we're only finding 10%, it's still huge numbers. Man, the vastness of the universe, just how much it is actually in, in there. Yeah. <laughs> phenomenal. Um, Edward would like to know who's uh, tuning in from Concord, Mass. Uh, what's your best guess about how common Earth-like planets are compared to non-Earth-like candidates? Gotcha. So yeah, what we found uh, from studies thus far is that the most common types of planets by far are in are the small planets, what we call right now super Earths or sub-Neptune. So planets smaller than Neptune, bigger than the Earth. Um, and we think those are kind of the peak of exoplanet formation results. These are the most common type of planet that you form. And then Earth-like planets, a little less common. It, it tails off a bit as you get smaller. We think, based on studies from the Kepler satellite, which stared at the same patch of sky for four years, so it studied the same stars and has this very long baseline, which means it's more sensitive to planets on Earth-like orbits. We didn't actually find Earth with Kepler. We did not find an Earth-sized planet around a sun-like star on a one-year orbit, but we got close. We found planets that are slightly bigger. We found planets that are slightly closer in. So if you take those results and extrapolate them very carefully and kind of building in all this knowledge we have, I believe the number is that, you know, Earth-like, Earth analogs, we expect them to exist around something like two or three percent of sun-like stars. Now, there's some wiggle room there because again, we, we didn't find one. So that box in our search space is currently empty. We're kind of, you know, building from what we did find. But yeah, we, we think it's like a few percent. That's uh, compared to the amount of exoplanets, that's it's quite small. Indeed. And so this is why, you know, when NASA is thinking about this future flagship mission, that its job is to go and try and take pictures of Earth analogs, you need to make sure that the telescope or the, the satellite is big enough that you can survey, you know, a hundred stars. Because if you're only expecting a few percent of them to have these Earth analog planets, you don't want to build a giant mission and launch it and then not find anything. So there's a lot of very clever people thinking about ways to optimize this right now. It's going to be the, the subject of much, you know, design and debate over the next five to 10 years as we figure out how to optimize this mission to make sure we find at least a few of these Earth-like planets and can take direct images, direct spectra of them. Great. So um, just to, to go back to um, our discussion about life, uh, mm -hmm. or a little bit. A, uh, Michael would like to know, so life anywhere depends on some entity harnessing a chemical reaction that makes heat available. So we're familiar with oxidation, but what about other kinds of reactions that could support life? Uh, kind of like what's happening in the suboceanic thermal vents. Are we also looking for things like that? Yeah, so there are folks on Earth who study uh, what are called extremophiles. And so these are, you know, animals um, and sometimes plants, I think, that can survive in these you know, very extreme environments, whether that is like a highly acidic or basic environment, uh, a very cold or very hot environment, things like that. And I think those are providing some guidance on other ways to sustain life that the subocean vent is a great example. So there are animals that live down there that you know, don't get any sunlight because they're so far from the surface, but they survive thanks to these geothermic vents that um, are, are putting off heat. And so they can use that. And so I think that's probably the, the most common, like, you know, next guess at what life could right. do is that if you had a heat source, then maybe that's enough to sustain you. Um, I think there are also, you know, folks looking into more complicated things. I know there are people looking at um, the the hot springs that are in, I think, various national parks around the U.S. Yeah, and those environments also like great source of heat. There's water, which we think is probably a necessity for life to allow, especially all of the like single cell organisms to to mix and mingle. Um, so you need some sort of liquid environment for that but that also have these very strong like mineral components or you know high um, pH or high acidity things again. And so I think that's kind of the, the main area that I'm aware of of people thinking about it. 
Um, there's also folks thinking about life, you know, under uh, the the icy crusts of like moons in the solar system. So yeah. you know, places like Europa, um, and whether or not you could sustain life there, where it's likely to be quite chilly, but again, like nice liquid environment that's protected by this outer icy crust. Maybe you have some tidal heating because the planets are pulling on the moons gravitationally and that can warm things up. We mm -hmm. think that's what's happening um, certainly on places like Io where you have big volcanoes. Those are mostly caused right. by gravitational tugs from Jupiter. So there's a, a couple of different branches and yeah, there are folks thinking about it. I don't know what the, the best option is. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're curious about extremophiles, Julia put a link in the chat um, all about extremophiles. So uh, you can check that out. They are a well. trippy read. You should click that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another attendee, Don, would like to know, um, and, and I think this is a great question because a lot of times we can look to exoplanets to kind of see what Earth was like or could <laughs> be like um, in the future. So if we hit six degrees centigrade with climate change, are we on our way to looking like Venus? Ooh. I don't know that Venus is the end result. Um, but Venus is an example of what we call a runaway greenhouse effect. And so we think there were things that happened in Venus's earlier history, not, not driven by climate change, uh, no humans on Venus, but due to the chemical makeup of the planet where instead of it being able to sequester things like carbon dioxide into its oceans, which is what the earth has done. And it, it sequesters these you know, greenhouse gases first into the oceans and then they become sediment. Um, they're trapped in the rocks underneath sometimes. Venus didn't have that capability. Uh, and so those all accumulated in its atmosphere and built up this thicker and thicker layer of you know, greenhouse gases around it. And that accelerated the process of heating the planet. And that's why nowadays, you know, if you landed on Venus, you would melt. And there indeed have been like one or two landers that went to Venus and got a few moments of footage and then melted. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't know that we would end up like Venus, but yeah, if we, we hit that mark or even, I mean, really any additional heating of the earth, we're not in great shape. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. a, a concern and one that people should take very seriously. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, another guest, Sivale, would like to know, considering the fact that stars are many light years away, what percentage of stars visible in the sky uh, still exist? Ooh. So I don't know the exact number. The answer is probably most of them. It depends on what you mean by visible is how I should start that. So there's, <laughs> there's a distribution of types of stars, and we normally classify them based on either their mass or their temperature, and those numbers kind of go hand in hand for most of them. So the sun is what we call a G-type star. It's kind of the middle of the, the main sequence, which is the, the time in a star's lifetime when it's happily like burning hydrogen and kind of doing normal star things. Um, the more massive a star is, the shorter its lifetime. Those are inversely related to one another. And so, you know, big stars that are hundreds or thousands of times um, the mass of the sun don't live very long, you know, millions right. of years, maybe a billion years. The lower mass you get to things like uh, what we call M dwarfs or red dwarf stars, so much smaller, much cooler, they look much redder. Um, those things live for forever, <laughs> like quite literally longer than the the uh, the history of the universe right now. So wow. mm -hmm. if you can, if you think about how these are distributed in population, M dwarfs are the most common type of star in the galaxy. Um, and so for every you know sun-like star, there are mm, three or four, maybe it's even more than that, M dwarf stars. And so those things are not dying anytime soon. They have, you know, from whatever they were created, their lifetime expand, extends past what the amount of time the universe has existed so far. So the majority of stars that have been created still exist, but in that population of much higher mass stars, a lot of those have already gone through their end of life stages, whether that's turning into supernovas um, or becoming black holes or becoming white dwarfs at the end. And right. the, the end of those stars, we think actually is what creates a lot of the heavier elements in the universe. So yeah. things you know like aluminum and gold and stuff like that are often generated during these end stage processes where the stars are burning heavier and heavier elements as they age. And so those those stars that have already died and you know kind of emitted their their remnants into the universe are why we have a lot of the you know not just hydrogen and helium and things out to lithium it's you know we, we have much heavier elements because of them mm. 
Um, we have a question that's a little farther down the list, but relevant. Um, what star types are best for life? So are we looking at specific types of stars that we think will be best for, you know, having life on them? Yeah, so this, again, it comes back to the idea of we know life exists here, so let's look for us. Right. Um, and so when we think about looking for, for star or for planets that might host life, we're often focusing on um, stars that are a little bit hotter than the sun and then down to like the, the warmest of the end dwarfs. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple ways to think about that. So there, there are kind of two main focuses, I think, in the, the search for life on what you look for. One is we're going to look at stars just like the sun because we want to find a system just like ours. Um, and the other is we're going to look at M dwarfs because those stars are much cooler. It means that their habitable zones are much closer to the star. They don't put out as much energy as the sun. So you need to be much closer in as a planet to, to be warmed up to the same kind of cozy temperatures we have on Earth. And that means that the planets are in much shorter periods. And what that means is that instead of having to observe a star, you know, for at least three years to see a planet go around at least three times, which is often what we want to believe that the signal is real and robust and repeats, you know, as expected, the habitable zone around an M-dwarf is like 20 days. So instead of three years, you stare at this thing for two months and you're like, okay, I see the planet go around three times. You know, this is great. Mm -hmm. So while the stars are quite different and they are often prone to things like emitting more high energy radiation. So like stellar flares on M-dwarfs is a concern. High amounts of magnetic activity and X-ray radiation is a concern. They are currently the easiest place to look for planets in the habitable zone. And so there's you know, a lot of folks focusing on that because it is what we can do right now. And then there are also folks focusing on pushing our technology and our data analysis uh, methods forward so that we can eventually find you know, Earth-like planets around stars like the sun. So we're, we're inching closer and closer to that, but it's still you know, a few years off at least. Mm. Um, I think we, ha we have a great question from Ronnie who would like to know, what's the difference between a moon and an exoplanet? And you know, like when we're looking for them, how can you tell the difference? Yeah, uh, so the main, the main difference is just what they are orbiting. So an exoplanet orbits a star and a moon orbits an exoplanet. And so if you, you know, have a body, even if it's quite small, orbiting a star that has managed to, to establish its own orbit and kind of cleared it out, then that would be considered a planet, even if it is the same size as our moon. Um, folks are starting to look, I have been looking for a while for evidence of moons around exoplanets, mostly using that transit method uh, with the idea that, you know, the same way a moon or a, a planet transits in front of the star, if there's a moon transiting around the exoplanet, you could maybe see the signature of that as well if the two body system is moving across the surface of the star. Um, we don't have any super definitive detections yet, but there are a couple of, of candidates that have made it into the literature and that we think are, you know, likely to be real. Um, but they're very small signals, they're very hard to confirm. And so, you know, there's a, a lot of active work being done there. And hopefully, as we move forward with even more precise transit measurements in the future, we'll have a whole population of exomoons. Great. Um, Glenn from New Hampshire would like to know, have you detected evidence of any elements on an exoplanet that are unknown to us? Ooh, I don't, not that I'm aware of. Um, there's a whole aspect of astronomy that is kind of lab-based astrophysics where folks are working very hard to take the gaseous forms or even the liquid forms of elements that we do know and make sure that we understand their fingerprints very well because many of these um, atoms or molecules create lot, you know, millions of lines in different wavelengths. And so mapping out exactly where those lines exist, how they change as a function of temperature and pressure, um, and then understanding how you know, mixtures of elements and molecules look when you, you put them both around the same planet is an area that has is currently making you know real strides forward. There are people who have been working on this for a long time, and it's I think often an underfunded and undervalued part of astronomy. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, as we're creating the capabilities to observe more exoplanet atmospheres, you only get the right answer if you can actually say this is definitely what methane looks like at this wavelength range and at this temperature and pressure. And so. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're starting to realize like we should be paying more attention to this and, and giving it more money. Yeah. yeah so sure. as far as I know, no, we haven't found anything that we can't explain yet, but there are definitely debates. There was a, an announcement 
of, you know, we found water around a super earth, this planet K218b, um, which is not actually like the earth, it's much bigger. And so th this was not like water around an earth like planet, it was a little bit hyped up too much in the media. Um, and then that was huge news and, and made headlines everywhere. And then a few years later, folks were like, actually, maybe it's methane. Like maybe we can explain the signal with a different combination of things. And so it's, you know, it's this lab-based astrophysics where we're making sure we understand the signatures very well that will hopefully let us distinguish confidently between these cases in the future. Right. Um, we have a question from Phil in Linfield who would like to know why do most stars have a planet? Oh, um, I mean, the basic idea of planet formation is that a star comes into being from a, a big gas of material, or sorry, a big gas, a big cloud of gaseous material that falls in, it in spirals into itself and kind of condenses into the star. And then once that happens, um, as the star is forming, the material often flattens down into a disk around the star, what we call a protoplanetary disk. Mm -hmm. And because there's a bunch of gas and you know rocks and other materials that are in that disk and orbiting around the star they start to aggregate into a planet and it's actually i think this is still kind of an unsolved problem we we have a good understanding of how you go from like you know micron sized particles things you can't see with your eye to like kind of pebble sized particles things that are like a couple you know an inch or so across and then we kind of understand like once you have a planet how it accretes atmospheres and things. The question of how you go from like the pebbles to the planet is still a, an open debate. And there are a couple of different ideas about how that is most likely to happen. But yeah, it's there's just so much, you know, excess material from when a star forms, it ends up in this disk that's rotating around the star that it is likely that at least some of it is gonna end up, you know, bumping in and cold bumping into each other and coalescing into a planet. Cool. Yeah, the things that we can do. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, we have a question from Ravi who would like to know, um, has a question about Drake's equation. So, so um, first it'd be great if you could explain for folks that may not know uh, what Drake's equation is. And then um, has anyone tried to modify or add to it? Yeah, so Drake's equation um, was this, you know, the thought exercise a while ago, which is, is the main question is, what is the, likelihood or what is the fraction of stars that are likely to host life and so it has a bunch of terms in it um, and each one is a, another consideration that you need to kind of fold in when thinking about this so the first one is how many stars are there you know in the galaxy or universe depending on what scale you want to think on so let's say galaxy how many stars are there in the galaxy how many of those stars are likely to host planets how many of those planets are likely to be you know terrestrial like the earth which is what we think can host life right now how many of those Earth-like planets around sun-like stars are likely to have had the conditions necessary for life? There is liquid water, they are the right temperature, they have the right amount of sunlight hitting them, et cetera. How many of those sun-like stars in the galaxy that have Earth-like planets that are at the right temperature and have the right amount of water are likely to have had you know, the, the uh, proto-life like genesis that you, know, you need to start having single cell organisms? And it goes on and on. And so, it was a way to get at you know a, a order of magnitude estimate of how much life we expect. Um, there have been some attempts, certainly, to revisit those terms now that we know more about you know how common planets are and what the distribution of planets is around different types of stars. So folks have gone back and tried to to look into that some more and have more accurate numbers in there. I think we've also um, there are folks who have you know, looked at this and added new terms based on what we've learned about astrobiology and habitability over the last few years or last decade or so. And so, yeah, there are there are many attempts to kind of update Drake's equation and make it more in line with our current understanding of exoplanets um, and what we've found. Great. And, you know, our time together is almost closed. So I have one question. Our final question for you um, is from Diana, and she would like to know what would you speculate could be the state of our knowledge of exoplanets 20 years from now? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so hopefully 20 years from now, um, some big things have happened. So NASA has launched this flagship mission that's gonna go take pictures of 
Earth analogs around nearby stars, and we're going to have a much better sense of, is there a planet like the Earth around a nearby sun-like star? Mm -hmm. And I think that will, you know, settle a lot of debates and, and questions about this. Um, hopefully by then we have even more telescopes and, and telescope time available so that we can confirm the majority of these planet candidates that I mentioned, because they are going to keep rolling in. There is no shortage of planets for us to find, but the, the facility time and the man or people power necessary to confirm them is in short supply. Um, and yeah, I, I hope that exoplanets you know, become a much more common household name. I think we've done really well with outreach and like press announcements. It's a fun topic. People get excited about it. But I think that we'll have a much better sense of our place in the galaxy by then. And that it'll be something that like, you know, everyday folks know about it and have a sense of like where we stand in discovery space and what kind of things we're finding on a day to day. So yeah, new facilities are going to push us forward into detecting some of the most both Earth-like and most extreme planets. And then hopefully, you know, the folks working on lab astrophysics and theory, et cetera, are going to be able to, to tell us even more about those worlds based on what we know of their current status, how they evolved, things like that. Perfect. Well, Dr. Jennifer Bird, thank you so much for joining us and for asking and answering all of our questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was an absolute pleasure. Your audience asked wonderful questions. Um, so kudos to everyone who put something in the chat and apologies to those we didn't get to. Yes, I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions today. But that said, if you do have any questions that did not get answered, um, we are going to put Jen's social information in the chat. Feel free sure. to give her a follow and then maybe you can ask her a question there. And there's also been a bunch of great links um, put in the chat throughout our time today that I encourage you to look up to get some more information. Um, so thank you again for everyone that attended, that you were here with us for asking your questions. Without you, this event would not be possible. So thank you for your engagement. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Take care and we'll see you soon.